privilege of attending the CASP and NASP uh, conventions during my first year. That is the California Association and National Association of School Psychologists. I remember attending the opening session of CASP, where Mr. Leonard, the president of CASP at the time, was the keynote speaker. He talked about what a difference one of his elementary school teachers had made in his life because she believed in him. While Mr. Leonard was speaking, the attendees of the CAST convention, mainly school psychologists and educators, all nodded and agreed with Mr. Leonard's main point. We, as educators, or rather we, as part of children's lives, can make a difference. Knowing that a whole room of seasoned psychologists and educators, and even me, as a first year at the time, could agree on this point, really solidified that I had made the right career choice. I came up with the Gale Convention inspired by this moment. I want us to start conversations early and to try to come into schools and other institutions with a game plan of how to solve the problems we know are there. In the future, I hope this convention can grow to involve other future school psychologists, counselors, and future educators from various programs so we can share our thoughts, inspire each other, and remember that we are on this career path for the same reason, to make a difference. I thank you sincerely for coming to support this convention. I hope that as you go through Gale workshops presented by these amazing scholars, that you are inspired. Our theme this year is Collaborate to Educate. And looking around this room of graduate students, undergraduate students, alumni, faculty, and yes, even one registered nurse who I don't think is here yet. <laughs> but I did look at the registration. Um, I can anticipate um, that there will be many opportunities to collaborate and learn from one another. Thank you, and here's my amazing co-chair, Moses Cooley. Hello, everyone. My name is Moses Cooley, co-founder and president of the Counseling Graduate Student Association. Thank you, Jen. It has been an honor, an absolute honor, working with you and the team for the, for the past couple months playing this convention. Well, I don't want to bore everyone with uh, more details, but you have said it very well. We, as counselors, school psychologists, educators, helping professionals, as a whole, need to collaborate to educate in order to cater to the needs of our nation's diverse schools. That is why the Counseling Graduate Student Association at LMU could not help but answer your call to action to collaborate and educate. Thus, let us all, as helping professionals, rise, hold hands, share our resources, knowledge, and bring the fun back into our professions. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, we're going to have to pick up that energy. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We're good. We're good. I have to make sure that we're all fired up because not only one of my closest friends is going to be the keynote speaker, but we're also business partners, and she's a colleague of mine. Um, I just really, really feel honored and privileged to be able to introduce you to her. Um, she's my inspiration. Uh, when I was thinking about what should I say, you know, when I was introducing her, I was like, I have to think about the first time that we met. And after talking with her in a couple minutes, I was like, this woman is a woman on fire, okay? <laughs> I was like, who? she got a lot going on. She's the type of friend and professional that's on like five committees, got three streams of income, and, you know, got three different degrees, and she still has time to like answer a phone call when you're like, have boy trouble. <laughs> um, and so, uh, really thinking about uh, how excited I am that she's going to be sharing some of her experiences. Um, well, one, she got her undergrad degree from Spelman, so uh, thank you, right? <laughs> she got her... Uh, undergrad degree in psychology so already from the beginning she already knew that she was going to be a helper and then after that experience she decided to actually start an organization called FIRE and if you look on your uh, program it starts it stands for fearless individuals resistant to entrapment and basically what that organization's goal is to provide resources and services to individuals so they can overcome those obstacles that are keeping them from living purposeful and healthy and happy lives and so she started this her own organization, and from there she went here to LA, got her master's degree in psychology from Pepperdine, and like Pepperdine so much, she was like, let me get a you know a PsyD in clinical psychology, 
And now she's a forensic fellow um, as well. So yes, I, I know, right? We can keep going. Uh, besides all that, she's also an adjunct professor for two colleges, um, Pacific Oaks College and also Pepperdine. She just cannot stay away from Pepperdine. Uh, and in addition, she's going to be releasing her first book, and it's called The 21-Day Relationship Healing Devotional and Journal. And it's basically a poetry-based book that promotes restoration through reflection. So that's going to be coming out, and you can talk to me afterwards if you want to be one of the first to purchase it. Um, and so uh, if right now, if you're taking any photos or video, we just really encourage you to help promote her to others by doing the hashtag. Dr. Jamel LMU, and that's D R G I M E L L M U. And I, she has to jet afterwards, so if you want her business card, just come find me, and I'll make sure that you connect with her. So I think I mentioned a lot, and then two, she's also heavily involved in her church, and she's also heavily involved in her sorority. I will leave the sorority name out, but you can probably guess by how she's dressed. And if you don't know, you better ask somebody uh, what organization she's a part of. So. Please just help me welcome her to the stage, Dr. Jamel Rogers. Thank you, Erin, for that lovely introduction. Good morning, everyone. Good, Good morning. morning. Education without empowerment is enrichment of your ego. We have come here today to learn how to separate out our ego when we educate to understand the importance of empowering our brothers and our sisters, those who look like us and those who do not, to ascertain how to educate using the tools that do not discriminate, marginalize, and segregate. We have come here today to recognize that even though it is 2017, there is still much work to be done in our system, and that when we educate, we must empower, because if we are not empowering, we are falling short to the call that has been put upon us. If we do not empower, we are contributing to the systematic oppression that has been lying in our system for hundreds of years. We have come here today to realize that without empowerment, education does not exist and progression of our people will be dismissed. To know that it is not our ego that we are feeding to say that we have taught at the most prestigious schools or taught hundreds of youth. Rather, we must comprehend that we are called to empower. For education without empowerment is enrichment of our ego. To distinguish between empowerment of self and empowerment of others, that we do not get our credentials to empower our egos, but the generations before us. As change agents, educators, professors, mentors, and directors, we are charged with not only fulfilling our duties and our careers, but most importantly, the call that has been put upon our lives. For education without empowerment is enrichment of your ego. Good morning. My name is Dr. Jamel Rogers, professor of psychology at Pacific Oaks and Pepperdine University and forensic fellow at IVAD in San Diego. Today we will explore and reflect upon empowering our future through education. As educators, we must liberate. We must liberate individuals who are systematically oppressed and left without a voice. We must liberate the oppressors who for years have no reason as to why they even continue to persecute. We must liberate ourselves by becoming aware of our own implicit biases. Without liberation, we will be lost on our journey due to the systematic complexities. Without liberation, we will not be able to achieve competence to implement a culturally sustaining pedagogy. Without liberation, we will continue to subjugate persons to our own prejudices. Without liberation of ourselves, we will become the oppressors and contribute to the cyclical effects of bigotry instead of the restoration of humanity. Today, I'm going to review the essence of the systematic complexities and how culturally relevant and culturally sustaining pedagogies have addressed them, the necessity of understanding your own implicit biases, and creating a culturally inclusive learning environment. Gloria Ladison Billings. How many people have heard of Gloria Ladison Billings? Well, we're going to learn something today. <laughs> she published an article toward a theory of culturally relevant pedagogy which focused on making teaching and learning more relevant and responsive to various languages, literacies, and cultural practices of students who are typically marginalized. This article was based on her seminal research uh, for teachers of African-American students. 
Her research highlighted evidence resource pedagogies when working with students of color who are marginalized by systematic inequalities based on race, ethnicity, and language. Her research sought to provide teaching circular in interventions and innovations that would move educating and learning even further from the deficit approaches that was instituted in our system from the beginning of time. These deficit approaches covertly incorporated the educational system to eradicate the linguistic, literate, and cultural practices of many students of color brought from their own cultural backgrounds. Due to this viewpoint that these practices were deemed deficient, the overarching goal was to replace them with what was regarded as superior. Throughout the decades, this framework has been evolving, but the central tenet has remained the same. Students are expected to lose their heritage and community, culture, and linguistic practices if they are to succeed in American schooling. In essence, if the majority do not subscribe to it or recognize it, it simply does not matter, nor is it regarding as living up to the system standard. This in part is due to the fact that different cultures have different standards of what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. We know as Americans, sometimes we have the my way or highway type of attitude, meaning that you say you learn how we say to learn or you won't learn at all. As an educator, you have to learn how to navigate the system standard and your personal standards. And I encourage you to include empowerment for all cultures as a part of your pedagogical teaching standard. For example, if you have a student in your classroom from the Netherlands, a culture that serves mayonnaise with their fries as their standard, but in America, ketchup is served as the system standard, and you as an educator being from America believe that ketchup goes with fries, not mayonnaise, are you going to force the student to eat the ketchup with their fries or empower them to know that although their culture is different from yours, it is not deficient? and mayonnaise can taste just as good. My hope is that you choose to empower your student to know that their customs and ways of learning may be different from your personal standards and the system standards, but it is not deficient. Because as an educator of the future, as we continue to move from shunning differences, I encourage you to remember that interactions between people, as well as interactions between people and their cultural environments influence learning. That was Ladison Billings' goal, to humbly influence learning by addressing these adverse constructs through her model and philosophy of culturally relevant pedagogy. However, recently the term relevant has been brought into question through inclusive of its adding to the systematic inequalities. Through development of cultural competence defined as students being able to maintain their community and heritage in the process of gaining access to the dominant ones, she saw these practices would be the driving force behind academic achievement without loss of identity. Although Ladison Billings laid a strong foundation toward the eradication of, del of the deleterious educational inequalities, we must continue to ponder if in fact her research and practice is being produced under the umbrella of cultural relevance is truly ensuring the maintenance of language and various cultures. We need to contemplate if in fact the students are empowered to have a choice between mayonnaise only or mayonnaise and ketchup or forced to have ketchup only. These questions were the apex to Django Paris's charge. He has charged us to take a critical stance and critique against unequal relations resulting from such research and practice. And if the terms relevant and responsive are what we are after teaching and learning in a pluralistic society, he suggests that it is possible to be relevant and responsive to something without ensuring its continuing presence in a student's life. Hence, it is possible to recognize that mayonnaise is a rich part of a student's culture, but ensure that the student does not preserve its richness. Django Paris addressed this question by coining the term culturally sustaining pedagogy. How many of you have heard of that? All right. He posits that it embodies some of the best research and practice because it supports the value of our multi-ethnic and multilingual present and future. 
Culturally sustaining pedagogy seeks to perpetuate and foster linguistic, literate, and cultural pluralism as part of the democratic project of schooling. Now you may be wondering if the end goal is the same, then why and how does one word change the function of the modality? Well, I am glad that you questioned his alternative. <laughs> he indicates that this term culturally sustaining requires that our teaching approaches be more than responsive of or relevant to the cultural experiences and practices of our students. It requires that educators support young people in sustaining the cultural and linguistic competence of their communities while simultaneously offering access to dominant cultural competence. Essentially, sustaining the fact that mayonnaise is acceptable and value, as well as know that ketchup is accessible and available to you if you would like it. Likewise, when we are designing unique ways of sustaining and extending the cultural practices, it is important that we do not essentialize and are not over-deterministic in our languages of language and other cultural practices to certain racial and ethnic groups in approaching what it is we are seeking to sustain. We must not be stereotyped or pre prejudiced in our approaches. Rather be inquisitive because everyone that may phenotypically look similar or has the same rituals do not all have the same cultural practices. Culture starts in the home via rearing practices. It is seen in gender identification, in sexuality, in spirituality, in morals, and in values. Therefore, I encourage you all to have a willingness and desire to learn from your students through questions, conversations, and experiences to find ways to genuinely relate and understand your students. I encourage you not to become culturally encapsulated by lacking knowledge and understanding through ignorance of another's cultural background because you fail to recognize the significance that a person's culture plays in their learning and in the lens in which he or she views the world. So, I know inquiring minds are still wondering, how do you empower and liberate others through education? This is achieved by increasing your students' self-concept and communal awareness. Self-concept is comprised of one's positive self-esteem, how you feel about yourself, and one's self-efficacy, the agency to accomplish the goal set forth. Thus, it leads to a healthier self-concept and overall view of self. A healthier self-concept will provide a more accurate depiction of one's capabilities. Empowering students to have a healthier self-concept enables them to internalize the wherewithal that they have the ability to achieve. When a person starts to believe in the labels that have been put on them, they create self-fulfilling prophecies. Therefore, as educators, research has indicated when teachers have high expectations of their students, their performance is maximized. Yes, you as the educator have the ability to maximize your students' performance. Empowering your students encourages them to know that they have the ability to excel beyond the common core standards, beyond the limitations that the educational system has set for them, and beyond the goals that they have set for themselves. Ultimately, empowerment of the students and not your ego will provide the desired results, but the students as the focal point. In addition to increasing one's self-concept, their communal awareness will increase through experiential and practical application. Knowledge with application fosters an appreciation of the content that they are learning. This will result in a firmer sense of self-identity, increased understanding, tolerance and acceptance of others and a stronger cultural identity. Overall, being cognizant of cultural differences will garner communal awareness and ensuring acceptance of others instead of condemnation. Next, in order to break the barriers of the systematic oppression that has been inherent to our education system, and empower our students by increasing their self-concept and communal awareness. As an educator, it is utmost important to be attentive and reactive to your own implicit biases. Implicit biases are attitudes and beliefs that affect our behaviors in our unconscious manner. These biases, which encompass both favorable and unfavorable assessments, are activated involuntarily and without awareness or intentional control. 
Implicit biases have a real world effect on our behavior. Implicit biases are malleable. Therefore, implicit associations that we have formed can be changed, unlearned, and replaced with new mental associations. Identifying these biases will also provide insight to when you engage in microaggressions, which are intentional or unintentional causal degradation of any socially marginalized group, such as the poor and the disabled, that often perpetuate by very well-meaning people who hold egalitarian beliefs. As educators, I encourage you to reflect on your own implicit biases and how they manifest into microaggressions, particularly micro-invalidations, which are communications that subtly exclude, negate, or nullify the thoughts, feelings, or experiential reality of a person. According to Dr. Boskinen, to decrease these implicit biases, which lead to microaggressions and microinvalidations in our, in our classroom, increasing self-awareness, creating an inclusive learning environment, creating learning opportunities for positive interactions, and developing empathetic skills to decrease implicit biases are key. Thus, modeling, being the representative of a strong justification for greater emphasis on creating learning opportunities and skill development of these competencies for both the students and the educators. Overall, empowering students to sustain their own cultural practices and educating on them on the dominant culture and understanding your own implicit biases will aid in implementing models of engagement. These models of engagement will open yourself to being flexible in the rapid global changing technology, families, economic system, education, and social health. These models of engagement will provide you the gratitude for different worlds, cultural and values, and allow one to define one's experience through their own reality and truth. Creating a culturally inclusive classroom is one where a student and staff alike recognize and appreciate and capitalize on diversity to enrich the overall learning experience. Fostering a culturally inclusive learning environment encourages all students, regardless of age, gender, ethnicity, and personal context for effective intercultural skills. Here are some useful strategies to establish a culturally inclusive classroom characterized by mutual respect, genuine appreciation of diversity, and an inquisitive mind. Of note, even if you are not currently in the classroom, these strategies for inclusivity are still applicable to your setting. First, engage in interactions with students. Next, actively discourage classroom inclivities then encourage open, honest, respectful classroom discussion, and finally use language and appropriate modes of address. A avoid ignoring or neglecting the needs of individual students, stereotypes and preconceived assumptions in your teaching practices and course content. This will illuminate the appreciation you have for the diversity and cultural differences in your classroom. For example, one personal demonstration of cultural competency and sensitivity to diversity was a time I had a student whose second language was English in conjunction with medical obligations, which hindered this student to attend class regularly. As a professor, I met with the student and used different mediums to communicate to ensure that their understanding of the course content was still being met. I also met with the student's need by extending deadlines and working with the Office of Disability. This experience enhanced my patience and empathy for students that not only have language barriers, which may lead to academic challenges, but also physical dis disabilities that may hinder their performance. Furthermore, my model of inclusivity encouraged open dialogue about the need and flexibility to working with a student who has special needs and accommodations without singling or putting anyone on the spot. Conclusively, when collaborating with parents, colleagues, and entities, it is key that you develop your own meaning of diversity, cultural, linguistic, emotional, and behavioral basis so you can model for your students. I encourage you today to really look inside yourself to design how would you as an educator approach a culturally inclusive classroom. 
because educating others is for the empowerment of them and not your ego. Educating others is to build a society and not just your curriculum vita. Educating others is to empower them to be world changers and liberators with a more culturally inclusive perspective. Through all of these systems of oppression and models of liberation, I would be doing you all a disservice if I did not offer one last important inquiry. Who is your teacher? Who is your teacher? In Dallas Willier's book, The Great Omission, he offers that in a world where there is a great deal of information, misinformation, and disinformation, people have pushed aside Christ. He explains that many Christians do not even think of him as one with reliable information about their lives. As Christians, we must ask ourselves, why do we not respect Christ in our various fields of study and expertise? And why do we not recognize him as a master of research and knowledge in our fields? These are questions to ponder because in our society, Jesus Christ is automatically disassociated from brilliance or intellectual capacity. Sometimes we forget that Jesus is the smartest person who ever lived. Sometimes we forget that it was his father who was the original environmentalist. So ask yourself, who is your teacher? Reflecting on Colossians 2, 3, in whom all are hidden, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, how do you as an educator see Christ in your everyday experiences? Seeking him will not only aid in understanding the diversity, but being the epitome of a culturally competent educator. Today we discuss the essence of the systematic complexities and how culturally relevant and culturally sustaining pedagogies have addressed them, the necessity of understanding your own implicit biases, and creating a culturally inclusive learning environment. However, being a university that represents the Christian teachings, it would be unjust if I did not encourage you to remember who the ultimate first teacher was and still is. He is, he is who will give you the patience, he will give you the wisdom, and he will give you the understanding in this ever-changing political climate. So I encourage you to be collaborative in your efforts, inclusive in your programming, and empathetic during your interactions. Thank you.